uh, pretty good that uh, Zoom works well in these conditions, I hope. What I'm going to talk about is early railways uh, west of Wigan, um, particularly about coal transport. Um, and I have an exhibit here, <laughs> a piece of coal, which uh, I, I'm just thinking maybe some younger kids today have never seen a piece of coal. Um, so it, uh, things change over the decades. Uh, let me show you one other piece. It's, uh, I do a lot of sculpture, uh, mainly wood, but sometimes stone. Can anybody, well, it's muted, so I won't ask a question. It's a piece of ironstone that comes out of the coal seams from uh, Blundell's Colliery in Pemberton. But when I got this piece, it was highly exfoliated, like an onion with all the softer, fragile pieces on the outside. So I got rid of those and then actually did a sculpture in ironstone, which as far as I know is unique. I don't know anybody else who's tried to do a sculpture in ironstone. Uh, as a way of introduction, let me identify some books that have been very useful to me in preparing my research. One is Donald Anderson's book on the oral coal field that was published in 1975. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information in here on different aspects of coal mining. Uh, Donald, of course, was a surveyor and an engineer, so he goes into great detail in many cases. I've read this book so many times, and I, when I first read it, I find it difficult to get a time horizon of everything. So one of the motivations in my talk will be to try to put um, a lot of detailed information a little more simply and as an overall view. The other excellent work is a book called Geographical Change and Industrial Revolution by John Langton of Liverpool University. That was published in 1979. And thirdly, a book on the industrial railways of the Wigan coal field. It's in three parts. This part is on the west and south of Wigan. Again, that uh, provides a lot of very detailed information. On the early railways, they take most of their information from Donald Anderson's book. So with that, I'll, I'll start my uh, presentation. Oops, wrong one. So I hope everybody can see the full screen there. Yeah. So I'll be talking about the early railways west of Wigan. Uh, that doesn't mean there's, there's nothing interesting to talk about to the north and east, but I'm focusing just to the west of Wigan over the time period 1770 to 1870. And you might not tell from my American accent these days, but I am from Wigan, I'm from Highfield. Although I've lived in this country for about uh, 40 years, I still, still regard myself as a Wiganer and get back to Wigan about once a year except this year, of course. So what I'll be talking about is the building of early railways, why they were built, where they were built, how they were built, and who built them. As a way of sort of putting everything in perspective, I constructed a diagram uh, from, of, of time. So it, it, it extends from 2000 years ago, about Roman time, when we know there may be some evidence of, of Romans perhaps mining coal in, in the Wigan area uh, through to the present day here. So in this long-term time perspective, population increased, the red line increased very slowly uh, until about 17, late 1700s, which is our time that we start discussion of transport of coal in larger quantities. So the period I'm talking about, 1770 to 1870, uh, really just covers this small area here. And that, of course, led to the mainline railways and huge population growth in Wigan. The population is pretty much stabilized at a higher level. But coal mining, of course, ceased a few decades ago. So looking at this long term perspective, coal mining and the, the industrial coal milling aspects of, of Wigan appears as a, as a blip. So it might be interesting to think about uh, the future, whether we expect any blips, and if so, what nature they might take in the long-term future. 
We start off with uh, a little bit of discussion on early coal mining and starting with the distribution of the British coal fields. So here we are, uh, the Lancashire coal field, Wigan being right there. So back in the 1700s, at the start of the period of our interest, the uh, Northumberland Dun Durham, the great northern coal field up here, was producing large quantities of coal. A couple of million tons a year were being sent down from the northeast to, to London and to Amsterdam and Europe. And they were able to do this because some of the coal seams outcropped fairly close to the surface, but also it was easy for them to transport the coal uh, by gravity down to the river, load the boats uh, with coal, and then ship them down the coast in pretty large quantities. By comparison, Wigan here, you see the maj major difference between the Lancashire and the Northumberland Durham coal field is the Southwest Lancashire coal field here is landlocked. It's not on the coast. And that was the major detriment in uh, the slower development of the, of the Lancashire coal. Most of the money needed to develop the coals in Northeast England came from local, local, local gentry, uh, local businessmen, and business people in, uh, in London, a lot of investment from London. As you'll see shortly, the sources of major investment in, in uh, Lancashire coal field was quite different. Again, as a background information to help you appreciate uh, what I'll talk about later is a topographic map here. We've got the coast here, Preston, Southport, Formby, Liverpool. Uh, over here, we've got the, the Pennines and Winter Hill coming down into Wigan, the River Douglas coming down here and up here and up through to the Ribble Estuary. So Wigan is in a, a valley. To the west of Wigan, uh, there's not easy transport down to the coast, which is really blocked by the Billings Ridge, Billings Hill and Ashes Beacon Ridge, which go up to about 500 feet. So there's a drop of about 400 feet from the Billings Ridge down into the canal and the River Douglas in Wigan. And you'll see the significance of these topographic uh, distributions later. So a lot of the early development of coal uh, depends upon the increased demand from Liverpool. Prior to this early growth, there was extensive small coal mining in the Wigan area. But the collieries were producing no more than a couple of thousand tons of coal per year. And most of the coal uh, would have been used locally or transported maybe 10, 15 or so miles by horse and cart or by panniers on pack horses. So as, as growth started to occur, particularly in Liverpool, um, we got increased demand uh, of coal in a more local environment in Liverpool. So the population of Liverpool around 1700 was about 6,000, which was approximately the same of Wigan at that time. By 1821, the population of Liverpool had increased to 150,000. We're now seeing a much larger city develop. Shipping tonnage from Liverpool, uh, a good sign of the business that was taking place in Liverpool, increased from about 9,000 tons in 1700 to 840,000 tons in 1821. So here we saw a very significant increase in the demand of coal from the South Lancashire coal field. What are you doing, Dave? Well, has gone off again. Can you hear? Yes. Okay. Let me see what's going on. Can I be heard? Is the one I just told you? Okay. Yeah, that's fine, Derek. Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned the sources of funding up on the northeast coal field. In, in the Wigan area, the early significant coal mines uh, were initially financed by some local people who tended to, to see the opportunity of investing in coal mines. 
but later on uh, the, the capital required to develop the coal fields and transport the coal was so large that the local people could no longer become the major financiers for the operations. So most of the, most of the money came from directly or indirectly from slave trade in Liverpool. You can see some figures here from 1783 to 90, uh, I think that should be 1893. There were, were 12 million pounds uh, proceeds from the African trade, which would be equivalent to somewhere between 1.2 and 87 billion pounds uh, in today's money. By the African slave trade, we mean boats owned by Liverpudlians going from Liverpool to West Africa, and they would take with them uh, guns, uh, cloths, materials um, made in this part of the country to West Africa and buy slaves in West Africa, transport those across the Caribbean to the Caribbean and later to, to this country, the United States. And then uh, in, on the return trip, the third leg of the tri triangular trade, bring sugar and coffee and uh, tobacco and other goods back over to England. So it's a very lucrative trade. So from 1722 to 1784, just pick, pick out the activities of one of the major uh, slave merchants and also coal developers in the Wigan area, the Blundells. The ships owned by the Blundells in that time period conducted 113 vo voyages carrying 31,000 slaves from West Africa uh, with 25,000 disembarking the, in the Caribbean. That meant they'd lost about 6,000 um, on the way across the Atlantic. Uh, John Clark, who will be our show, was one of the major investors in developing the coal field, was a Liverpudlian. His father, John Clark, um, sorry, uh, his father, William Clark, opened the first bank in Liverpool in 1774. So undoubtedly, a lot of the bank's money came from the, the slave trade. So the development of the railways, uh, I, I don't want to start off and give the impression that the people I'll talk about, um, a few people were, were the sole developers and uh, of the steam engine and other major developments. Like any technology, you tend to build on the shoulders of people before you. Uh, back in 1698, Slavery uh, developed a steam pump and he worked on the developments of people before him, like Pepin. By 1712, John Newcomb had developed an improved steam pump. This was a large stationary coal-fired engine that could be used for pumping water out of the mines and allowing the mines to go deeper. Um, the first Newcomen engine in Lancashire, I believe, was at Whiston in 1729. The first one on the Oral coal field was 1769. Uh, these are very expensive pieces of equipment, um, uh, but it, it shows that in order to, to get the coal to go deeper, uh, the coal, the coal uh, managers, colliers, had to invest in this technology, otherwise they couldn't operate the mines. 1769, Watt improved on a high-pressure steam engine. By 1782, Watt had developed a rotary motion steam engine which allowed vertical motion to be translated into rotary motion and this allowed the development of steam-fired uh, engines and uh, powered the mills and the whole rest of the Industrial Revolution. As far as specific railways are concerned, Richard Trevithick in 1804 uh, had built a steam locomotive and hauled a train over a short distance although it fell apart and broke and the rails broke after just a couple of operations. So it was not a, what you'd call a successful locomotive. So briefly, instead of going through the developments on each railway line that I'll show you, because it's far too much detail, I've tried to summarize the major transport developments. I've already mentioned that uh, horse and cart and panniers used to be transporting coal over relatively short distances. By uh, by about the 1770s, uh, wooden railway lines with a narrow four-foot gauge 
uh, were used and horses were still operating to, to pull those uh, uh, carts. By another decade or so, uh, we'd see the introduction of iron capped wooden railway lines, which increased the strength and resistance, reduced the wear on, on, as against purely wooden lines. By about 1800, we'd see the introduction of uh, iron railway lines and stone sleepers, giving much more rigidity and strength. The first uh, steam locomotive was a rack locomotive, which I'll talk about in more detail, uh, was in 1813. Uh, this was a rack locomotive. I'll show you a photograph of that to explain what I mean by that. Uh, a few years later, uh, they'd gone away from rack locomotives to pure adhesion locomotives, recognizing that the engines by this point could provide enough friction and traction of their own without having to resort to uh, uh, rack and pinion system. The standard gauge railways, uh, the main public railways, uh, came in about 1830 for both goods and passengers. But these were standard gauge, four foot eight and a half uh, railway lines. Uh, the colliery railway lines, which were predecessors to this, the public railways, uh, at some, some of them, after the introduction of public railways uh, were linked to the main line. So we had uh, transitions from narrow gauge to um, uh, standard gauge. This shows the network of public railways that was quickly built starting in about 1830. I mean, the first one in fact was the Bolton Lee line uh, started in 1828 and extended in 1831 to join up with the Liverpool-Manchester line, opened in 1830. Richard Daglish, who I'll talk about later, develop, uh, developing the uh, walking horse, was the person that laid out this earliest railway from Bolton to Lee. Um, 1832, we saw the introduction of main line up through Wigan, and two years later up extended up through Preston. In 1948, we saw the opening of the Berry to Liverpool line. In 1855, the line up through to Southport. So within two decades, the current main uh, railway lines have been established. What I'll focus on the rest of the presentations is small area to the west of Wigan, most of it in Winstonley, Oral and Pemberton. So it, it, I point out this because you'll see the incredible detail and developments that occurred in this area that in subsequent decades led to the development of this whole uh, complex uh, network of public uh, railways. So this is a, it's a very detailed map. Um, I, I can't spend time showing you information on each of the lines, but you'll see from number one, two, three, and so on, uh, up to number 12. 12 early railway lines during the period that I'm talking about. These started transporting the coal, first of all, from the Winston and Oral coal field and later from the coal fields further east down to the canal and the River Douglas. First of all, in, in 1742, the River Douglas, in order to make it more navigable, to allow some coal to be transported from this area out to the Irish Sea was, was transformed into the Douglas navigation, that was 1742. Um, they could carry loads of about 40 tons of coal uh, on some of the larger flats and boats. That lasted for about 30 years as a successful enterprise. And they built quite a number of weirs and locks and uh, uh, cuts uh, to make the River Douglas na navigable. In 1774, the Leeds and Liverpool Canal was opened from Liverpool down as far as Gathurst. By 1780, that uh, canal was extended through to Wigan. In subsequent years, it was extended through to the north of Wigan up to the Lancaster and to the southwest here, um, to Lee, where it could meet up with the uh, Bridgewater Canal. 
these these early railways, um, the first one is uh, the airfield uh, uh, railway line. And there's not a lot of information known on this, but it appears that the major investor here was John Longbottom, who was the Yorkshire engineer that built this western part of the Leeds Liverpool Canal. These early canal uh, railways down, didn't go to the canal, that wasn't built yet. These early railways were first built in the like, 1774, 76 period. So they used to go down to the River Douglas and unload their boats onto the River Douglas, as I mentioned before. When the canal was built, then the uh, railway lines were extended over the River Douglas uh, straight to the canal. And at Gathurst, you can still see um, the lock that connected the River Douglas to the canal, which allowed the transport of boats from the River Douglas onto the canal. Number two line here is um, Blundell's early railway. It started off um, in the fir first section here was actually built as a wooden railway line by Halliwell, who was a local businessman. I mean, he was a watchmaker. Uh, this time in the 1700s, Wigan was a major center for non-ferrous production of, of goods, particularly pewter. It was the second largest pewter manufacturing town in the country after London. So some of these people engaged in bell foundries and watchmaking had quite a bit of money. And Hollywell in particular uh, developed an early railway down here. Blundell, who was the, of the Blundell family that I mentioned earlier from Liverpool, obviously wanted uh, to invest some of the large sums of money earned from the slave trade in Liverpool uh, into coal development here. So he extended Hallowell's line and uh, in the 1776, 77. Uh, the number three line, which I'll talk about in more detail, was John Clark's line, uh, ultimately extending, this is the M6 here, extending from Longshore down through underneath the M6 through Winstonley uh, across the Pingot, which I'll tell you much more about this section here, and ultimately down to the canal at, at Crook. This is Winstonley Hall here, at just for location. Uh, number four line was, uh, where is it? Number four, where are you, number four? Oh, here, Hustler's line came up from the south side of Billinge Hill, um, like four miles down to the canal, uh, Gathurst. Hustler was one of the Yorkshire, uh, wool merchants who have it invested heavily in the canal and Hustler and Blundell were the two main people uh, that forged the development of the canal. So we obviously invested some of his money in developing the railway down to, to the uh, canal. Uh, number five is Woodcock's line. Numbers uh, going on through them quickly. Number six is um, Blundell's Railway. It's the same Blundell that built this line, later moved further west in Pemberton and developed his line. That's where I was born in, in Highfield, just there. He developed his line down Victoria Street. I'm sure many of you know that Victoria Street is pretty straight. The, the reason it's straight is because it was a, the site of the early railway going down to the canal. Uh, the German built a parallel railway, they wouldn't share the railway line. They, they never tended to share the resources very much, very independent. So German who developed coal fields around top of Billings Road, Newtown area, also built a second line down to the canal. Um, uh, there was a short railway line built by, uh, it's known as the Oral from the Oral uh, coal mines. Number 10 was built by the Daglishes, the, Dag the same Daglish that uh, built the walking horse that operated on Clark's line. Um, this was operated primarily by horse uh, horsepower, but
but there is some indication that the walking horse, which was first developed on this railway line in 1813, by the 1850s, the 60s, could have been moved down to Daglish's line from Norway down to the canal. And then we got a, a Roby Mill line uh, up here um, and then uh, Newtown line number 12 here. So this was in, remember that the scale, the geographical scale we're talking about here is in, it's about three miles across, about three miles north, south, three miles across. Incredibly small area for all this early railway development. This is a different way of summarizing all those uh, transportation lines. First of all, the River Douglas, which operated, uh, Douglas Navigation operated from about 1840s uh, until the canal people bought it out in the 70s. It did continue to operate some time afterwards, but not as a big operation. The Leeds and Liverpool Canal uh, came down to Gathurst in 1774 and to Wigan in 1780, and of course continued right through the, the two main line public ra uh, railways, the Berry Liverpool line, started. This star sta uh, is, is a representation of a standard gauge steam locomotive on the main railway line. And from the Wigan and Southport line a few years later. This is a summary of all the uh, private uh, railway lines that I talked about before. You can see how they developed at different times. Um, this is the narrow gauge steam locomotive, the walking horse that I'll uh, talk about in more detail. Um, Blundell's line uh, from Highfield down to the canal, first of all operated on uh, coal uh, transportation by horse and cart and gravity, but in after the uh, main railway line was opened to Liverpool, they did uh, start transforming to um, the, uh, the, the wide gauge railways. Uh, I won't go through much in each detail. Uh, just gives you the general impression of the development of 12 small railways and the introduction of the main, uh, main gauge railways. Each one of these small railways would end up, first of all, at the River Douglas and later in the canal with a tippler uh, tippling the coal from the coal wagons down into wading barges and then transported along the River Douglas or along the canal. This, of course, is the Wigan Pier um, uh, uh, tippler. And if you can see the writing here, it is called Winston Wing, which I love. Remnant of that Hustlers Railway coming down from uh, near Billings Hill. You can still see the remnant of that today as you go down Gathers Brow through the main road under the railway bridge. You can still see this uh, small narrow tunnel, which is where Hustlers Railway used to go through. So that may not even have been a four foot gauge railway, it could well have been a three foot six gauge railway. So talking about the development of the coal seams, uh, first of all, a little bit on the geology of the coal seams. The coal seams were laid down over 300 million years ago, primarily in fairly horizontal layered beds with shale and rock between and above them. Um, at the bottom of these deep coal seams in the Wigan area, are the two important coal seams called the oral four feet and the oral five feet seams, also known as the Smith and Arley seams. These two coal seams are very important because they were very high quality, much higher quality than many of the coal seams above them. If you look in the area I've put in this more or less a red triangle, which is the Winston Lake and Oral coal field, this is where the earliest development occurred. Um, the important thing here is these very rich oral and four feet coal seams occurred near the surface. This occurred because once the coal measures were laid down, they were subject over millions of years to movement by tectonic forces 
and by a lot of faulting. So whereas in the Winston and the Oral coal field, these two rich coal fields occur at or near the surface, there was a huge number of faults. So just a mile to the west here in Pemberton, the same coal seams were about 1500 feet down. So initially, um, the technology and the ability to pump water out of the mines didn't allow for these lower seams to be mined. All the early development occurred in this area where the rich oral four feet, four feet and five feet seams occurred at or near the surface. So initially, this was the area where most of the coal was, was mined. Uh, and the early railways taking it down to the Douglas and Canal. Um, further east, remember where the, these rich oral seams are much lower down. The development of this area only started later. Uh, Blundell, where he, he developed the earlier uh, railway up here about 1776, started developing the Pemberton Colliery in 1815 and subsequently developed his railway down to Wigan Pier. And all this coal from this area went down to the canal uh, further east and then out to Liverpool. So I tried to summarize the de development and the reasons why coal was developed in different parts at different rates. It's a complex diagram, so bear with me, see if I can explain it. So the left axis, we've got mining of coal in tons. So from zero up to 800,000 tons. On the right axis, we've got the depth of the coal mine, the depth at which the coal was mined from zero, which will be the surface down to over 2000 feet. So initially that Winstonley and Oral coal field, um, coal was being mined at less than 500 feet typically no more than 350 feet. It was shallow, easily acceptable, rich coal. And the, the production from that Winston and Oral coal field was approximately 50,000 50, tons per year. And it had been exhausted by about 1850. And this is when we see the development of the walking horse, which I'll talk about in more detail on the Winston and Oral coal field about 1813. So further east, as you, as you remember, the, that big fault had occurred so that these rich Winstonly, uh, Winst uh, oral five foot and four feet seams occurred much deeper. Blundell started developing Pemberton Colliery um, going down to about 400 feet in 1815. A bit deeper, a bit deeper. By 1869, they go down to get the much deeper oral four and five foot seams by this time. And coal production from the Blundell's colliery there increased gradually and then shot up. Uh, uh, and the value of the coals increased rapidly with the development of the oral four and five foot seams. But by 1910, Pemberton Colliery was producing nearly 800,000 tons of coal per year. So gradually, the, the, the Coal seams uh, were mined deeper and deeper, and the transportation of the coal, uh, first by uh, narrow gauge railways and subsequently by the main public line railways, increased dramatically. So, development of the Winston and Oral coal field. I mentioned John Clark, his father was uh, uh, first banker in uh, Liverpool. They were also merchants. So I don't know if they directly engaged in the slave trade or just engaged in uh, marketing other products. They started investing in the Oral and Winston the coal field about 1789. So about 12 years or so after Blundell. And gradually they expanded the, the mines and railway south into Winstonley. Uh, but 1810, they hired Robert Daglish as their colliery manager. Uh, Robert Daglish, as uh, Claire mentioned last time, was working as the uh, main engineer at the Hay Foundry. He was hired there about 1804 by uh, Lord Balcaras. 
1810, Clark hired him uh, as colliery manager in Winston Lee and to build a locomotive for him. Robert Diglish himself was born in Northumberland on that great uh, northeast uh, coal field in 1779. Um, and he became colliery manager in about 1810 in Winston Lee. So this is a more detail of um, the Pingart area. Oops. So, okay, let me locate you where we are here. Uh, where it says moat down here is the old moat around the original Winstonley Hall, which was probably a 13th century wooden hall surrounded on three sides by a moat. The current Winstonley Hall is just 200 yards to the south of this. So this is the Liverpool, um, Wigan-Liverpool line built in 1848. So John Clark, first of all, started developing his coal field down near the canal and expanded his, his, his mines up to, through Kit Green, up to Oral. And in 1792, he developed a 20 year lease from Merrick Banks, who was Squire Winston Lee Hall, with permission to get all the four feet, oral four feet coal under uh, a 20 year uh, agreement. And he mined all this area in the 1792 lease. Um, if you go, this is the Pingot area. I'll show you some more details of the viaduct across here. Uh, if you go across the current, what we, I don't know what you call it, I always used to call it the Red Bridge across the railway here, and you turn to the right and go up Brook Lane, right at the bottom of Brook Lane, you can still see the remnants of what was a lime kiln that was used, must have been used for, for building the uh, viaduct. Further along, this is the summer sales area, the level crossing here. Um, just to the left of there was uh, Clark's Bypit, and I'll show you the cap on Clark's Bypit, built around 1792. Um, in 1812, John Clark extended a, 30 -year, a new 30-year lease on coal in this area, right down Longshire, and back along here. And that was a motivation for developing uh, steam locomotive in this area. Let me explain why it's very important to understand the topography around here. I showed you that early map of the topography of the Wigan area. So these are the profiles of three of the early railways that I've mentioned before. First was Banks's railway, which comes from Windy Arbor down to the canal at Wigan. The second is Blundell's colliery from Highfield down to the canal at Wigan. And the third is that John Clark's line from Longshire through Winstonley. And then you come to a valley and the land actually goes up the other side to Oldham's Ford on Olmscote Road. So the big challenge for Clark was how to get coal up this relatively steep incline when no steam locomotive had been able to do that before. So one of the things he did was built this um, viaduct, stone viaduct across the ping up there. And this is the south side of Winston Lee Estate. This is going across the river uh, Smithy Brook and across to Brook Lane up here. The remnants of that lime kiln I showed you is shown in this etching, which will be around 1800 here. So it shows a viaduct of maybe 12, perhaps 15 feet tall, 11 arches extending about 150 yards across the uh, Smithy Brook in the Pingot area. When it was built in about 1800, they hadn't invented the steam locomotives yet, so it shows that transport of coals by horse and cart. It looks like a dual way carrying empty wagons this way and full like wagons that way. So if you, if you stand at the bottom of Brook Lane, 
and look, Brook Lane will be going up here. If you look slightly to the left, looking northwards, this will be the line that Clark's steam locomotive had to transcend. It's, it's, uh, it's a um, gradient of about 4%. This is where Clark's railway crosses Olmscott. I'm stood on Olmscott Road here, opposite, I think it's Branch, Banks Avenue, Bradshaw Street. And you look down, this is Oldham's Ford. This was actually the line that um, Clark's railway took and then down through here to the, down Kick Green and out to the canal at Crook. This was a model of the, allegedly of the steam locomotive built by Daglish and operating in Winstonley from January 1813. It became quite famous as, as the Yorkshire horse. And the reason for this was because the first steam, successful steam locomotive in the world that had proved to be commercially successful was the Salamanca operating from June 1812 at Middleton Colliery in Leeds. And I've talked a lot of, with uh, the historian there to get a lot of this information. This was the model of Eli Banks's Yorkshire horse, which was called the Yorkshire horse because that was a name used locally by the people in Winston and all. But it was also in, thought to be a copy of the locomotive developed in Leeds. It's often referred to as the Blenkinsop locomotive. In fact, Blenkinsop never built a locomotive. He patented this rack and pinion design, so you can see the teeth uh, gripping into the uh, rack below. It was a method of locomotion. He never developed a steam engine. It was John uh, Matthew Murray in Leeds who actually built that first locomotive. So Eli Banks essentially built a copy of, of this with details from the London Museum. So it's an accurate depiction of this. So when I started doing the detailed research on this, it became apparent to me that the Gleish's locomotive was not a simple model of the Yorkshire locomotive. And therefore I proposed, and it seemed to be accepted over the last uh, eight years or so, that we stop calling it the Yorkshire horse and call it the walking horse for, for Daglish, which was also the local name used for the locomotive. We don't have any actual photographs or models of Daglish's walking horse. But when I started doing detailed research on this uh, eight or nine years ago, um, this was a, a detailed diagram prepared for me by Thomas Shearer, who was an engineer in Germany, who'd taken great interest in some of this work. And obviously I can't go through all the details here, but it does show a very detailed engineering sketch of the walking horse. Now, how do I know the walking horse was not simply a copy of the uh, Blenkinsop uh, Murray locomotive? So I went to great lengths to get the engineering details from both Salamanca in the Leeds colliery and the Gleish's walking horse and compared them side by side. And I can't go through in great detail. I'll just highlight some of the differences to show some of the improvements that Daglish brought in. So the weight of the locomotives, Salamanca in Yorkshire was four to five tons. And Daglish's locomotive was six or seven tons. The engine of Salamanca was four to six horsepower and Daglish's was eight horsepower. The boiler in Salamanca was made out of cast iron and Daglish introduced wrought iron both into the boiler and chimney, which was uh, quite a major um, uh, development. The Salamanca didn't have a feed pump. Uh, Daglish's locomotive did have a brass feed pump with a two inch diameter and a four inch stroke. Coal consumption of Salamanca was between 74 and 93 pounds per hour and on uh, Daglish's locomotive, it was 140 pounds per hour. So those are improvements in the engine itself. If you go down to the, to the rails and the pedestals, 
there were significant improvements. And the reason that uh, Blenkinsop had introduced the cog system of locomotion was because the earlier locomotives developed by Trevithick and people continuously broke the railway lines, which were made of cast iron. So uh, Daglish introduced wrought iron for the rails, also introduced uh, much heavier, more solid railway lines, uh, bigger, more solid uh, pedestals, and much thicker, stronger stone sleepers. And therefore, the railway um, was, was strong and uh, the, the rails were solid. Salamanca actually only lasted for operations a few years and it blew itself up. And after a few years, that Leeds colliery reverted to uh, operating on uh, horse and cart, where the locomotive, Daglish subsequently built two more steam locomotives for the Oral Winston the Coalfield. And uh, so Daglish's locomotives operated successfully through to the 1840s or 50s. Is there much evidence of these early railways? Not much. Um, this is in the line from Winston. -Lew. We used to call it Phoenix Lane, Nicholson's Lane. I'm not sure what you might call it now. But the bridge over the motorway is up here. So it's east of the railway bridge. And this is a photograph from Donald Anderson's uh, book showing one of the stone sleepers, which was under here. So under this water and stone and gravel are the, is this line, dual line of stone sleepers from Clark's 1813 railway. And just east of that, um, by a stone wall around what was Clark's old number eight, but you can still see one of the thick stone sleepers. Um, <coughs> And with the two holes so the line would have been pegged down through the stone sleeper. I mentioned that Clark uh, sunk a bipit uh, during his first exploration of the Winston Coals in 1792. And that's the cap of the seal over the top of that pit, which is now, you can see it still, like you could a few years ago anyway, in the summer sails. Um, when I was growing up, uh, the steam locomotives used to get water, used to withdraw water from this old um, uh, bi-pit shaft and pump it to uh, provide a source of water for the steam locomotive. So uh, you've seen this one before, but just to locate a few things again. So that was that bi-pit that I told you is sealed. This is the summer sail level crossing, that's the bi-pit. Um, when when the mainline railway was built in 1848, they had to take out two of the stone arches from that viaduct and insert a, a, an iron uh, section in its place. This, that iron section, I'll show you a photograph in a minute, but that iron section was removed up here and provided a footpath from Duke's farm over to his land on this side. And the Arches Viaduct was demolished totally in, in 1890. And passage over the railway was provided by building what we call the Red Bridge uh, just to the west. So this is the photograph of that section that was built uh, across two arches of the old stone viaduct. And when the stone viaduct was, stone viaduct was demolished in 1790, was moved to this location as a footpath over the railway. So Clark and Daglish, of course, made a lot of money. They were rich enterprises on the Winston and Oral Coalfield. John Clark home was what you know was Oral Mount. I don't know if it's still a restaurant. Uh, just down the road from that on Ormskirt Road was uh, Daglish's home, which is now Wish FM. John Clark actually went bankrupt in 1816. There was a lot of disruptions to the economy caused by changes in European events. The end of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the European Wars, uh, affected a lot of prices and merchants were dealing with. Clark went bankrupt 
but they did allow, allow him to spend these last years in Crook Hall, which he owned at one point. John Daglish uh, was uh, buried in uh, uh, Apollon Parish Church, where John Clark is also buried. So to summarize the importance of these uh, early railways in Winston and Arrow, particularly uh, the walking horse. That arches viaduct, the stone viaduct, turns out to be the first railway viaduct and the first steam locomotive viaduct in the world. The walking horse was in operation in January 1813, was the first steam locomotive to be built and operated in Lancashire. It was the first steam locomotive in the world to cross a viaduct, which was stone. It was the first steam locomotive in the world to work for four decades. It was the first steam locomotive in the world to haul loaded wagons up a 4% incline. It was the third commercially successful steam locomotive in the world. And as I've shown, it had significant improvements over the Middleton locomotives, particularly with more power, wrought iron bowers and uh, boiler and chimney, feed pump, stronger rails, pedestals and sleepers. Uh, a lot of the introductions made by Daglish were uh, adopted later by people like George Stevenson, who adopted a wrought iron boiler in the 20-inch flue tube in 1814. J uh, Daglish himself was the first colliery manager to build a successful steam locomotive. A foundry, um, after the foundry in Leeds, was the second in the world to build a successful steam locomotive. So all this early railway development was a forerunner for the railway system and engines we have today. They're all built on uh, real solid foundations, primarily to develop uh, private coal mines to transport coal from the mines down to the river and canal. Just a summary of uh, coal mining in Wigan area. I think this was provided by Andy Lomax. It shows each dot is a pit shaft in the Wigan area, and there are over 1,000 of them. And I certainly know there are a lot not on this. So it's just riddled with all work workings. Uh, remnants of Blundell's Pemberton collieries, this would have been near the heyday of about 1920, when they employed about 3,000 workers. Of course, the, there was a lot of waste material deposited pretty freely. Uh, which is now cleared, of course, uh, housing estate on this area. One of the interesting developments with the coal field in Oral and Winstonley, the, the land was owned by gentry, such as the Squire Banks of Winstonley Hall. And in the agreements to Blundell and uh, Daglish, Clark, they insisted that they, didn't, they did not leave any waste like this. They had to refill and get rid of the waste. So it was only when people like Blundell uh, owned the land, but it was an absent landlord that you started seeing a lot of these huge spoil heaps. Um, so Matthew's church in Highfield, where I was baptized, was also built by uh, Blundell uh, in memory of his wife, who was uh, lady in waiting to Queen Victoria. So in summary, um, I've Wigan's railway history has been recorded and preserved in world literature. Um, um, in this publication, um, 10 years ago, I wanted to make sure that my research findings were preserved in world literature. So I submitted a paper uh, to the early railway conference that was being held in Carnarvon in uh, 18, sorry, <laughs> 2012. And the paper was accepted. I give a presentation at the conference, and it's sub subsequently published as a paper in the proceedings. So we do have a record of all this in world literature. So with that, I will finish and open it up if you have any questions.